willing to kiss a few frogs to find my prince. Who are the ones you meet before the one? For every faded romance and one true pairing, there are the runner-ups who burn brightly and fade away. They're not necessarily bad guys, but they're not the right guy. In romantic stories about straight women, there are five main types of red herring male love interests, and each represents a particular type of guy to be wary of, with a good reason he's not Mr. Right. Alcoholics, workaholics, commitment phobics, peeping toms, megalomaniacs, or perverts. But these guys do fulfill an important role. They're plot devices that help push our heroine toward who she really wants. It's Peter. I'm sorry. Red herring love interests often correspond to well-trodden fantasies of what the perfect relationship looks like. Oh my gosh, Monica's gonna go out with a millionaire. The problem is that when that fantasy becomes a reality, it never quite lives up to expectations. So the wrong love interest helps crystallize what the heroine really needs in a partner, rather than what society has told her she should want. Here's our take on what we learn from the five types of male love interests who don't stick around, and why sometimes fantasies should stay fantasies. Sure, he's perfect on paper, but the relationship just isn't going anywhere. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. A rich boyfriend is set up as a cheat code for life. He elevates you to a new social status, gets you into the best bars and clubs, takes you on the fanciest holidays, and treats you like a princess. However, what the rich guy on screen often teaches us is that money isn't everything and definitely shouldn't be the foundational aspect of a relationship. Give me a whore to a gutter rat! No way! I'd rather be his whore than your wife. In a number of stories, we see how wealth has the power to get people interested. What did you do today, Pete? I bought a restaurant, and I would like you to be the head chef. What? Oh! In Friends, the extreme wealth of Monica's flirtatious customer, Pete Becker, pushes her to overcome her initial lack of interest in him. When he's just a flirty customer, Monica rebuffs his advances, but after she learns how rich he is and he bombards her with expensive gestures, she gives him a chance and actively tries to develop an attraction for him. Then I'm not attracted to him at all. Still? No. It's driving me crazy. He has everything. Plus, he actually has everything. Eventually, she does feel something for him, something she would probably never have discovered if Pete weren't rich, in which case Monica likely would have trusted her gut and not dated him at all. Still, in the end, Pete's successful businessman tendency to throw himself into risky, all-consuming ventures until he dominates makes him a poor match for Monica. Well, I'm not gonna stop until I'm the ultimate fighting champion. <laughs> That guy stood on your neck until you passed out. And in a number of stories where the rich guy suitor charms a more regular girl, you get a sense that the culture clash in these pairings is too big. I'm not used to people who have it all together. I think you scare me. There's also often a sense of entitlement that comes with wealth, which is never attractive. In Titanic, Rose abandons her high society fiancé Cal for the poor artist Jack. Cal may have the money and the status to give her the perfect seeming life, but it's like he sees Rose as property rather than as a person. So you will honor me. <laughs> you will honor me the way a wife is required to honor a husband. And in Reality Bites, Lelena faces a similar decision between the bohemian musician Troy and the corporate TV executive Michael. Michael may be able to help her onto a fast track to being a successful filmmaker, but Lelena wants to be an artist, while Michael is purely driven by commerce. So it's Troy who really shares her values. It was probably a little slow, and, and, they, and they cut it up a little. Cut so it up? They cut up everything that meant anything to me. I mean, I don't even think you realize what you've done. You don't get it. Still, it's not always an easy journey to reject the considerable appeal of the red herring rich guy with all the luxury and potential shortcuts he represents. And there are plenty of real life examples of how that appeal can be seriously powerful and sometimes dangerous. The documentary The Tinder Swindler chronicles how conman Simon Levive convinced women to fall in love with him and take out loans for him, in large part by making them think he was a glamorous billionaire. And then he was asking me if I wanted to join them. We're traveling by private jet. The initial seduction of the Tinder swindler's apparent wealth seemed to blind women to who he really was. It felt like stepping into a movie. Often on screen, rich guy narratives feel like Cinderella stories, so it makes sense that a variation on the rich guy is the dreamy British guy, who feels like some throwback member of the landed gentry, or at least has the cute accent. 
You know, I think there's an art to a picnic basket. Apricot jam would never go with a sesame cracker. Of course it wouldn't. Yeah, it, it would go, go with, with a flaky, flaky baguette. baguette. But outside of a few escapist examples that lean into the fairy tale, stories featuring the rich guy tend to reveal that this fantasy is superficial and too good to be true. In reality, if the heroine wants to stay with this guy, she usually has to change who she is. Fun, sexy, and often clever, the bad boy seems irresistible. He lives life with an infectious playfulness that makes the heroine feel alive. And while she can see that he's not ideal relationship material in some ways, she convinces herself she can fix him. Eventually, though, she's confronted with the proof that she's ignoring far too many red flags. In Bridget Jones' diary, bad boy Daniel Cleaver, who's himself based on Pride and Prejudice's bad boy Mr. Wickham, seems a lot more exciting than stuffy, reserved Mark Darcy. I'm no longer tragic spinster, but proper girlfriend of bona fide sex god. So committed that he's taking me on a full-blown mini-break holiday weekend. But the problem with the bad boy is that he doesn't have good values. He's often after money, fun, and an easy life. So he's not going to be loyal to the heroine if someone richer or hotter comes along. And since he doesn't fully appreciate the heroine's true worth, he's not worthy of her. I'm not willing to gamble my whole life on someone who's... Well, not quite sure. Thanks to this video's sponsor, the fantasy game Bloodline Heroes of Lithus. If you love unique gotcha style games, this one is perfect for you. It has an intricate storyline where you can build your own kingdom and even manage the economy. But the best part is the way you can build a family by marrying members of different clans. Each clan has its own strengths and skills, so when you bring clans together and extend the family tree, you boost your offspring's powers. This makes the game a perfect combination of intuition and logic, which I love, and it means you never get tired of it because you can constantly develop your kingdom and the possibilities are endless. It's also beautiful. The characters are so realistic and well-designed, with all kinds of species, from lichen, otherwise known as werewolves, to the clan of Karg, who can transform into real dragons. You can download and play the game for free on both Android and iOS when you click the link in the description. For the next 30 days, you'll also get an exclusive starter pack worth 20 which includes gold, diamonds, and intimacy packs. Because the more intimate your couples are, the more powerful their issue will be. And when you use my link, you'll also get a super rare hybrid heir, half dragonborn, half demigod, which is an amazing way to start playing. There's nothing wrong with the nice guy, but does that make him Mr. Right? Often the nice guy is a phase the heroine goes through after she's been knocked down and needs to be built up. He reminds her what it's like to be treated with respect. If the rich guy shows the heroine the stars, then the nice guy brings her back down to earth. So flaws can be good. Flaws are the best part. In Sex and the City, Carrie falls for nice guy Aiden after growing weary of being taken for granted by unavailable rich guy Big. Aiden acts like the perfect partner to Carrie. Still, while Aiden's more humble, DIY, all-American life is charming, attractive, and sexy. This leather's about 100 years old. I stripped it off an old railroad car seat. It's not who Carrie is. So as things get more serious, Carrie freaks out and sabotages the relationship. The irony is Aiden's acting exactly the way I wish Big would have behaved, and I'm behaving just like Big. In New Girl, Cece also starts dating a nice guy, Robbie, after she's feeling burned by her breakup with Schmidt and her previous history of dating attractive but very not nice guys. So she's drawn to average-seeming Robbie for his decency. I gotta know, why him? I mean, what, what is his brand? He's just a good guy. This isn't enough to mean that Robbie is Cece's true match, but in the end, seeing Cece with Robbie actually helps her real love, Schmidt, better understand what's important to Cece and stop viewing her as an unattainable prize to be won. Are you still in love with Cece? No. That's the... Yes. I am. It's killing me. Grey's Anatomy's Meredith Grey has her own nice guy conundrum, too, with the vet, Finn, who's kinder and less arrogant than her main love interest, Derek. But ultimately, the spark that's there with her and Derek isn't with her and Finn. You're a wonderful guy. And you may even be the better guy. But... He's the one. In recent years, there are more and more examples of the faux nice guy, as we've discussed in our nice guy video. But even when he's the real thing, the lesson of the nice guy phase is often that niceness isn't enough on its own. Rather, it should be a baseline within a relationship where there's more in common. Josh may not be perfect, but he happens to be a really, really great guy. Okay, he could be stronger, a little more decisive, 
Could go five minutes without saying I love you. In Gilmore Girls, Rory actually starts out with the nice guy boyfriend, Dean, but as her world gets bigger, she needs a partner who shares more of her intellectual interests or ambitions. Dean, this is about Harvard. Oh, well, excuse me, it's about Harvard, I forgot. So sometimes the heroine just outgrows the nice guy. While she doesn't want to hurt someone who's only ever treated her well, ultimately his niceness and her sense of obligation aren't enough to mean they should end up together. I'm Drew. Sorry, I smell like frosting. I just love to bake. I want to go to there. So most of the guys film and TV heroines end up choosing are pretty hot, but sometimes they're really hot. While the nice guys and rich guys may look for a minute like potential long-term options, the hot guy often feels from the start like a short-term solution. The driving force in these relationships is invariably sex, and sometimes this is important. In Friends, Rachel's first relationship after jilting Barry at the altar is with the rugged, passionate Italian, Paolo. The first time he smiled at me, those three seconds were more exciting than three weeks in Bermuda with Barry. Pre Paolo, it looks like Ross and Rachel could get together sooner, but that would mean Rachel moving on from one long term relationship to another without time to breathe in between. So, as much as Ross hates Paolo, the fling probably helped Ross by giving Rachel that space to recenter. That Paolo thing was barely a relationship. All it really was was just, you know, meaningless animal sex. Sometimes there's a sense that the hot guy is too hot, and so too good to be true. In 30 Rock, Liz's neighbor Drew feels like the perfect guy, but he lives in a bubble created by his hotness. Since everyone has always been far too nice to him, he's like a child who barely knows how to live in the real world. No, what is this? Dr. Drew's Salmon Bourguignon. What is this orangey taste? Gatorade. Occasionally, the hot guy surprises the woman with hidden depth, like when Samantha on Sex and the City expects Smith to just be a stereotypical himbo hot guy but falls for him when he turns out to be a deep, nice person. I'm shaving my head, all right? And it's scary and awful and you can't handle it. Who says I can't handle it? Let me be here for you. Still, the hot guy can more often be disappointingly superficial, which makes sense given that people tend to value him for his looks. And insecure, when Issa matches with hot Felix on Tinder, he turns out to be pretty mean and critical, so he doesn't even deliver that good time she was looking for. Yeah, your hair is different than your picture. Oh, um, I like to switch it up. You ever switch it back? The perfect on paper guy can be rich, hot, nice, exciting, or all of the above. He's the guy who has every item on the heroine's checklist, and if you just look at the facts, he's probably more perfect for her than the one. But there's some ineffable reason why the one is her true match instead. It was like magic. magic. In Sleepless in Seattle, Annie feels crazy for risking her relationship with her lovely fiancé Walter to pursue a spark with a guy she heard on the radio, yet in the end, that instinct is driving her to the person she's really meant to be with. I don't want to be someone that anyone settles for. Walter, I don't deserve you. In To All the Boys, P.S. I Still Love You, Laura Jean is tempted to choose smart, cultured John Ambrose over her jock boyfriend Peter Kavinsky because John actually shares far more of her interests, but giving it a try just makes her realize the depth of her feelings for Peter. Sometimes you have to kiss the wrong man to know what's right. Frozen plays with the perfect on paper love interest and the dreamy rich guy fantasy by having Anna fall for Prince Hans, a guy who seems the picture of the classic Prince Charming but is actually a devious schemer. Like the Tinder swindler, Hans is playing the part he knows Anna will find dashing so that he can use her for his own ends. You are so desperate for love, you are willing to marry me just like that. So in the end, this plot reveals that Anna's initial ideas about her ideal partner were naive and superficial, and that made her vulnerable to manipulation. You got engaged to someone you just met that day? Often, the rich guy, bad boy, nice guy, hot guy, or perfect on paper guy draws the heroine's interest immediately. He's clearly attractive and seems wonderful in theory. By contrast, the one might be someone unassuming, who doesn't seem so exciting or perfect at first and probably doesn't fit the heroine's romantic expectations. Hey, Miller. Hey. Fantasies can be valuable, and maybe the one does turn out to be successful, gorgeous, or generally wonderful, but ultimately, real relationships are far more complex and unexplainable than whatever theoretical ideas we start out with about what we're looking for. Sometimes real love doesn't make sense on paper, but does in person, and that's more exciting and interesting than any fantasy could ever be. I'm scared as hell to want you. 
But here I am, wanting you anyway. Thank you for watching The Take. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know what you're watching.